Chapter 9 The Horror Moves We must overtake it before it reaches the crossroads, shouted Little. They were speeding by the sea, tearing at seventy miles an hour down a long white road that twisted and turned between ramparts of sand. On both sides were towered dunes, enormous, majestic morning stars a-glitter upon the dark waters intermittently visible beyond their seaward walls. The horseshoe-shaped isthmus extended for six miles into the sea, and then doubled back toward the Jersey coast. At the point where it changed its direction stood a crossroad, explicitly signposted with two pointing hands. One of these junctions led directly toward the mainland, the other into a dense ocean-defiled waste, marshy and impregnable, a kind of morose where anything or any one might hide most indefinitely. And toward this retreat, Chagna fled. For hours, Little's car had pursued it along the tarred and Macedonic roads that fringed the Jersey coast, over bridges and viaducts, and across the wastes of sand, into a straight line from Osby Park to Atlantic City, and then across country and back again to the coast, and now were down a thin terran lashed by Atlantic spray, deserted save for a few ramshackle huts of fishermen and a vast congregation of gulls. Jagnafan had moved with unbelievable rapidity from the instant when they had first encountered it, crouching solemnly in the shadows beneath a deserted bathhouse at Long Branch, and had turned the light on it and watched it awake to the moment when it had gone shambling away through the darkness. Its every movement had been ominous with menace. Twice it had stopped in the road and waited for them to approach, and once its own great arms had raised itself against them in a gesture of malignant defiance. On that occasion, only the entropy machine had saved them. Its light Chagna could not bear, and when Little had turned the ray upon the creature's flanks, the great obscene body had heaved and shuddered, and a ghastly screeching had issued from its bulbous lips. And then forward again it forged, its thick, stumpy legs moving with the rapidity of pistons, carrying it over the ground so rapidly that the car could not keep pace. Always its tracks had remained visible, for phosphorus essence steamed from them, illuminating its retreat, and always its hoarse bellowing can be heard upon the distance, frightened with fury and a hatred most incalculable. And by the stench, too, they trailed it, for all the air through which it passed was acidly defiled, pungent with an uncleanness that evades all description. It's infinitely old, cried Little, as he maneuvered the car about the base of a sea lash dune. Eh, as old as the earth crust, otherwise it would have crumbled. He saw how the bathhouse crumbled, how the shells beneath its feet dissolve and vanish. It's only its age that saves it. You had the light on it for five minutes, shouted Algernon, his voice harsh with excitement, and it still lives. What can we do? We must corner it, keep the light directly at it for oh, many minutes. We need to send it back. We must decrease the random element in it by a billion years. It remains substantially as it is now for at least that long, perhaps longer. How many years of Earth time does the machine lop off a minute? shouted Imbert. Mm, can't tell exactly. It works different with different objects. Metal, stone, wood, all have different entropy rhythm. Uh, roughly, it should reverse entropy through a billion years of Earth time in... Ten or fifteen. There it is, 
shouted Algernon. It's raced the crossroads, look! Against a windshield glazed with semest, Imbert laid his forehead, peering with his bulging eyes at the form of Chagna, frostfully illumined a quarter mile before them upon the road, and even as he stared the distance between the car and the loathsome horror diminished by fifty yards. Hey, is it moving? cried Little. He had half risen from his seat and was gripping the wheel as though it were living. It's waiting for us. Uh, turn on the light, sir, quick. For God's sake, we're almost on top of it. Algernon fell upon his knees in the dark and groped about for the switch. The engine's roar increased as Little stepped furiously upon the accelerator. The light, quick! Little almost screamed out the words. Algernon's fingers found the switch and thrust it sharply upward. There ensued the drone of revolving spheres. It's moving again. Oh, God, it's moving! Algernon rose shakingly to his feet. Where is it? he shouted. I don't see it. It's looking for the marshes, shouted Little. Look, straight ahead, through here. He pointed to a clear spot to the windshield. Craning hysterically, Algernon described a fluorescent bulk making off over the narrowest of the bisecting roads. With a frantic spin of the wheel, Little turned the car about and sent the speedometer soaring. The road grew narrower and more uneven as they advanced, and the car careened perilously. Careful! Algernon called out warningly. We'll get ditched. Better slow up. No, cautioned Little, his voice sharp with alarm. No, we can't stop now. The light from the machine was steaming, unimpeded into the darkness before them. Keep a train on the road, shouted Little. It would destroy a man in an instant. They could smell the mud flats now, a pungent salty order of stagnant brine and putescent selfish drifted toward them, whipped by the wind. A sickly yellow light was spreading shuglessly in the eastern sky. Across the road ahead of them, a turtle shambled and then vanished hideously in a flash. See that? cried Little. That's how Chogno would go if it wasn't as old as the earth. Be ready with the brakes, Algernon shouted back. The end of the road had swept into view. It ran swiftly downhill for fifty yards and terminated in a sandy waste that was half submerged at slower levels. The illumined bulk of Chogno bounced for an instant upon the sandy hillock. Then it moved rapidly downward toward the flats, its arms spread wide, body swaying strangely, as though it were in awe of the sea. Little steered the car to the side of the road, then threw on the brakes. Out, both of you, he shouted. Algernon descended to the ground, stood for an instant shaking clingingly to the door of the car. Then in a sudden access of determination, he sprang back and began tugging upon the machine, whilst Imbert strove violently to assist him. There came a bellow from the great form that was advancing into the marsh. Algernon drew close to Little and gripped him firmly by the arm. Hadn't we better wait here? he asked, his voice tight with strain. It seems to fear the sea. We can entrench ourselves here. Uh, attack it with the light when it climbs back. No, says Little, his reply empathetic. We haven't a second to waste. It, it might mire itself. It's too massive to flounder through the mud without becoming hopelessly bogged down. We'll drive it forward into the marsh. Resolutely he stopped, beckoning to his companions to assist him in raising and supporting the machine. Dawn was spreading in the east as the three men staggered downward over the sandy wastes. 
a planet salvation in the glittering shape they carried. Straight into the morose they went, quaking with terror, but impelled by a determination that was oblivious to caution. From Chagna there now came an insistent screeching and a bellowing, a noise that smote so ominously on Algonon's ear that he wanted desperately to drop the machine and head back to the car. But above the obscene bellowing of the horror rose Little's voice in his courageous exhortation. Don't stop for an instant, he cried. We must keep it from circling back to the road. It'll turn in a moment. It's sinking deeper and deeper. It'll have to turn. Their shoes sank into the sea-soaked marsh weeds, while luridly across the glistening morrows streamed the greenish light from the machine, effacing everything in its path, save the mud itself, which bubbled and heaved, made younger in an instant by ten thousand years. And then, suddenly, the great thing turned and faced them. Knee-deep in the soft mud, it turned, its glowing flanks quivering with ire, its trunk blindly upraised, a flail of flame. For an instant it loomed, thus terrible, menacing, the soul of all malignancy and horror, a cancerous cyclops, oozing fetter, then the light swept over it, and it recoiled with a convulsive trembling of its entire weighty bulk. Though half-mired, it retreated once more, swayingly, and its bellows turned to the hoarse gurglings, such as no animal throat had uttered in Earth's eons of sentient evolution. And then, slowly, it began to change as the light streamed over it, enveloping it. It began unmistakably to shrivel and darken. Keep the light steady, Little cried out, his voice tremulous with concern, his features set in an expression of utter revulsion. Algonon and Imbert continued to advance with the machine, as sickened as little was by what they saw, but supported now by the disappearance of all uncertainty as to the truth of little's claim. And now that which had taken itself an earth form in Eon's most primordial began awfully to disincarnate and before their gaze was enacted a drama so revolting as to imperil reason. A burning horror withdrew from its garments of clay, and retraced in patterns of unspeakable dimness the history of its enshrinement. Not instantly had it incarnate itself, but by stages slow and phantasmal and sickening. To ascend, Chagna had had to feast, not on men at first, for there were no men when it lay venomously outspread upon the earth's crust, but on entities no less malignant than itself, the spawn of star births incalculable. For before the earth cooled, she had drawn from the skies a noxious progeny, drawn earthward by her holocaust they had come, and relentlessly Chagna had devoured them. And now as that which had occurred in the beginning was enacting anew, these blasphemies were disgorged, and above the dark wreck defilement spread, and at last from a beast shape to a jelly, Chagna passed, a jelly enveloped in the darting filaments of a corpse pale flame. For an instant it moved above the black marsh, as it had moved in the beginning, 
when it had come from beyond the universe of stars to wax bestial in the presence of man. And then the flames vanished, and nothing remained but a cold wind blowing across the estuary from the open sea. Little laid out a great cry. Algernon released his hold on the machine and dropped to his knees upon the wet earth. Imba, too, relinquished the machine, but before he doing, he shot back the lever upon its base. Only for an instant did that victory go unchallenged, for before the spears on the machine had ceased to revolve, before even the light had vanished from that gleaming waste, the malignancy that had been Chagnafon reshaped itself in the sky above them. Indescribably, it loomed through the grey sea mists, its bulk magnified a thousandfold, its long dangling trunk swaying slowly back and forth. For an instant it towered above them, glaring most venomously. Then, like a racer, it stooped, floundered forward, and went groping about with its monstrous hands for the little shapes it hated. It was still groping when it dimmed and vanished into the depths of the hazy, dawn-brightened sky.